Every time I look at the morning paper there on the very front page, hate and crime, another big scandal. Who will it be today? As the prices rise and morals decline, hope falls to an all-time low. Everything looks bad, it can make you real sad if it wasn't for the things I know. I know my sins are covered by the blood of the righteous Lamb. I know that heaven is waiting and the saints will soon move in. I'm not shaking because I'm not staying in this world of pain and sin. I know by the signs that are given, I know by what I've been reading, I know by every indication Jesus is coming again. When the evening news, it's now available 24 hours a day. It can't be told in 30 short minutes. It's a never-ending unsolved case. There's another big scene that's waiting in the wings, and the headline will unfold. While the world is bright, and I'm so enlightened by the things in the book, I know. I know my sins are covered by the blood of the righteous Lamb. And I know that heaven is waiting and the saints will soon move in. I'm not shaking because I'm not staying in this world of pain and sin. I know by the signs that are given, I know by what I've been reading, I know by every indication Jesus is coming again. I know. I know my sins are covered by the blood of the righteous Lamb. I know. I know that heaven is waiting and the saints will soon move in. I'm not shaking because I'm not staying in this world of pain and sin. I know by the signs that are given. I know by what I've been reading. I know by every indication Jesus is coming again. I know. I know. Sins are covered by the blood of the righteous Lamb. And I know, I know that heaven is waiting and the saints will soon move in. I'm not shaking because I'm not staying in this world of pain and sin. I know by the signs that are given, I know by what I've been reading, I know by every indication Jesus is coming again. Covered by the blood of the righteous Lamb, and I know, I know that heaven, heaven is waiting and the saints will soon move in. Well, I'm not shaking because I'm not staying in this world of pain and sin. I know by the signs that are given, I know by what I've been reading, I know by every indication Jesus is coming again. I'm not shaking because I'm not staying in this world of pain and sin. I know by the signs that are given, I know by what I've been reading, I know by every indication Jesus is coming again. Amen. Stand with us. We continue to sing. We love to sing around here. 542 in the hymn book, if you're using that, or we'll put the words on our screen. <clears throat> when we all get to heaven. Now, this song's a little bit misleading. People sing this, and they think, well, everybody's going. When we all get there, not everybody's going. There's only one way to get there. You'll hear about it as we continue to sing and we preach today. But I hope before you leave this place today, you can be assured. You're going to go to heaven one day. You sing it with us this morning. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day. We'll sing. 
Thank y'all so much. We also enjoy singing a couple of choruses, just a kind of foot patting choruses. And one of our favorites is this one. It's called Sanctuary. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true. And uh, every born-again believer, this ought to be a testimony of, uh, of their faith. We'll, we'll sing it through a, a time or two and let you get a hold of it. Here, here we go. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. And it ought to be a testimony of every born-again believer to be a sanctuary, a dwelling place, a testimony of the grace and the love and the mercy and the compassion and the forgiveness of God. We try to be that in front of other people. In my class, we were teaching to, or I'm teaching to, the Sermon on the Mount. God's called us to be salt and God's called us to be light. And it's written in a tense, you are the only light and you are the only salt. We're it. There is nothing else. So, Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary as we sing that through. Sing it as a testimony. Here we go. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Shake hands with them.
I, uh, I'm one of those people, I like to go and visit historic places. You know, I'm that nerd that stands there and reads every plaque, you know, all the information I can. My wife, she just walks on past and leaves me standing there. But uh, I enjoy that kind of thing. And the application of that to this song is you can go to places in the world and you can go to the tomb of some very religious figureheads of other religions. You can go and uh, see Buddha still laying there in his tomb. You can go and see the bones of Muhammad. You can go to these other places and that, that, that person who was famous, they're still there. We do that with uh, dignitaries and presidents where they lay in state so people can come by and see their dead bodies and pay their homage and respect to them. But there's one very, very famous religious person. I, I hate to use that word, but um, for the benefit of our, our guest today, I'll use that word. His name was Jesus. If you go and visit his tomb, there's a big difference. He's not there. The Bible prophesied that he'd die and that he'd rise again. And guess what he did? Just that. And I've asked him to come into my heart life and save me. And I've taken advantage of his conquering death. And one day, this body will die. But the real me, my soul, will never die. And I'll go to join him in a place called heaven for all eternity. And that's the message that we want to give you today. That if you know him like I know him, you'll get to enjoy that too. Yeah, your body may die, but you never will. And you'll get to go to a place called heaven. Now, the, the opposite side of that coin is, is when your body dies, you are still going to live on somewhere. And if it's not in heaven with the Savior, it's going to be in hell eternally, separated from God. There's no getting out. There's no second chance. There's no plan B. So I beg you today, I, I, I want you to know him like I know him. As a Savior. As, a, as, as an eternal Savior. Someone who can walk with you through this life and be with you for all of eternity. You listen to what this song says. I walked by the tomb of Buddha. I looked inside and I saw his bones. Then I traveled on to see Muhammad. He was still wrapped up. In his great clothes but Then I journeyed to a garden Where old Joseph left him lay The precious lamb God's own begotten Guess what? He was no longer in the grave. If you knew him like I know him, you would know that he's alive. And if you felt him like I feel, Deep inside, you'd know he's living, and death has died. Now if you're wandering in the darkness, come and step into his light. Those nail-scarred hands 
reach out to help you to pull you safe from death to life friend I too have stood where you said could I trust in things unseen but just one step in his direction then in love he ran to me so if you continue to sing this song goes right along with that one it says because he lives he didn't die he lives we can enjoy that you sing it with us as our choir goes down and our ushers come in to take today's offering God sent his son they called him Jesus he came to love, heal and forgive. He lived and died to buy my pardon. An empty grave is there to prove my Savior.
I can face tomorrow because he lives all fear is gold because I know he holds the future and life is worth the living just because he lives. Good morning. If you could see what I once was If you could go with me Way back to where I started from I know you could see A miracle of love that took me and its sweet embrace and made me what I am today a sinner saved by grace I'm just a sinner saved by grace when I stood condemned to death he took my place now I live I breathe in freedom with each breath of life I take. I'm loved and forgiven. Back with the living, I'm just a sinner. Say. How could I boast of anything I've ever seen or done? How could I dare to claim as mine the victories my God has won? Where would I be? Had God not brought me gently to his place and made me what I am today, a sinner saved by grace. Just a sinner saved by grace when I stood condemned to death, he took my place. Now I grow. I breathe in the freedom with each breath of life I take. I'm loved and forgiven. I'm back with the living. I'm 
just a sinner saved by grace. Now I grow, I breathe in freedom with each breath of life I take. I'm loved, I'm forgiven. I'm back with the living. I said I'm just a sinner. Say my grace. Say Thank you so much, Tom. All righty, again, uh, we are so proud, uh, if you're visiting with us, that you are here. And again, it is no accident that you are here. Uh, I, I don't know exactly what God may have for you. I'm just trying to deliver. I'm a messenger. Uh, and, and I hope that you'll listen, and you'll listen on purpose. You have your Bibles, I wish you'd turn with me in God's Word to the book of John, John chapter number 3, and I'm going to read three or four verses, and then we'll pray, and I promise you I won't be long. <laughs> Hush. I promise you. My wife and I, we're going to something this afternoon I've never been to before. We're going to a baby queue. You ever been to a baby queue? I'd never heard of a baby queue. You know what a baby queue is? Nope. It's a baby shower at a barbecue. <laughs> Ain't that cool? Our great grandbaby, uh, great our grandson, and they're going to have uh, they're going to have a going to have a baby. So we have to go. And I'm really looking forward to it. <laughs> okay. John chapter 3, verse 16. If you'll follow with me, I'll make a couple of comments as I go along. Very familiar verse. You know, most of us, maybe when we were growing up, we, we learned in Sunday school or we learned in a vacation Bible school, probably the first verse most of us learned. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Verse 17, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn them. The word condemn there means to, to judge people. That's not God's purpose to judge. I mean, he will, but that's not why he came, to judge the world. But that the world through him might be saved. In other words, Christ came not to condemn us and send us to hell. God came to give us an out. God came to save us. Oftentimes, people are confused about the word saved. They hear we Christians use that terminology a lot. Oh, you saved. Uh, you know, uh, uh, can you be saved? Whatever, the, whatever how you use it. The word saved here doesn't have per se, the idea of being saved from drowning or being saved from a building that's on fire. You could make that application. But the truth of the, what he's trying to convey, what he's trying to teach is being saved from having to pay the penalty of your sin. As already been stated several times, uh, we're all sinners. It doesn't make any difference. It starts here at this pulpit. We're all sinners. But you're either a saved sinner or you're not, it's one or the other. And to be saved simply means that you put your trust in someone to pay the price for your sin because you owed a price you could not pay. You were too broke spiritually right. to pay what you owe. Spiritual bankruptcy. And uh, so he says uh, that we might be saved through him. Verse 18, 
he that believeth on him is not condemned. Now, that's, that's a good one, that one sentence. He, anybody, that believeth, the word believeth means to trust in totally, absolutely, and completely. He that to believeth in him is not condemned, is not coming into judgment, ever. Okay? But he that believeth not is condemned already. Now, what's that mean, preacher? That means if you have never been saved, and, and, and I use that term, and there's a lot behind it, but if you've never come to that time in your life when you saw yourself as a sinner in need of a Savior, and you never bowed your head and asked Christ to come in your heart and life and be your Savior, then the Bible says you've been condemned to pay the price for your sin. Okay? Been condemned, coming under judgment. But he that believeth not is condemned already. In other words, already means this. You're one heartbeat from eternity. We, you know, we have no idea, only God knows the length of our lives. We have no idea how long, you know, we're going to live. Uh, you may make it through the day. You may make it through the, the decade, you know, decades. Who knows? But we don't know. That's the thing. Okay. We're just one heartbeat from, from eternity. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son, he's condemned because of that. Verse 19, and I'm through. And this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Now, that's pretty simple. Christ came into the world as light to the world. The world is a world of darkness. He came in as light to show people the way of salvation. Okay? And uh, the people love their darkness. What's that mean? They love their sin more than they love they would love Christ or put in their faith and trust in Christ. Now, oftentimes people will have this mindset of sin as something godless and something wicked and something ungodly and, and vile and all that kind of stuff. What he's talking about here, their sin, is this, there's only one sin that sends anybody to hell. Only one. It's not the sin of Adultery is not the sin of homosexuality. It's not the sin of that. That's the fruit of sin. Only one sin that will send anybody to hell, that's the sin of rejecting Christ as Savior. Right. Plain and simple. So you can, you, you can sit there and say something like this. Well, I, I'm, not, I'm, not as, I'm not that bad. I'm not as bad as Joe Blow. I'm not as bad as whomever, you know. And you may not be. But without Christ... You're a sinner in need of a Savior. doesn't matter, matter who you are, okay? So, and this is a condemnation that light is coming to the world, and men love darkness, their darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Father, for these few minutes that we'll take, it could be, I don't know, but it very well could be some of the most important minutes that some folk have. It doesn't matter to me whether they're a church member or whether they're a first-time guest. It's really immaterial. It's just Holy Spirit that you would have your liberty to speak to people's hearts. And they're going to have to choose one way or the other. And I just pray that uh, they would see the importance of putting faith in you. And I'll thank you for what you'll do. In Christ's name, amen and amen. First of all, I, I hope that you'll forgive me for using a personal illustration to introduce this message, okay? I try not to do that, but sometimes I do. But being I don't know anything at all about your love life, and I really don't care anything about knowing anything about your love life, I've got to use my own life as an illustration. <laughs> some of y'all sitting there, some of our church people have gotten so nervous right then. They say, Lord have mercy, what is he going to say? Okay. In just a few days, uh, 20 days, as a matter of fact, today's the third, 20 days, my wife and I will have celebrated 56 years of marriage. That will be our anniversary. And, and, and truth is, from my perspective, uh, at the time that we got married, I thought, 56 years ago, I really thought that I understood and knew what love was. 
you know, how long, I, I can remember well standing there next to her and just thinking I knew what love was. But you know, in all honesty, looking back at those 56 years, looking back at the first part of our marriage when we got marriage, married, I, I, I would venture to say that there was more lust than there was love. Now, you see, the word love is primarily a verb. And a verb in Scripture mean, is a meaning of, of, of an action word. In other words, love is demonstrated. If you want to show your love to someone, you can say it, and that's great. And I think you should. But love is, in all honesty, is something that you demonstrate to someone. Uh, through all these years that she and I have been married, all of the ups and downs and the valleys and the mountaintops and the trials and the victories and the challenges and the successes and all that, our love has prevailed by the grace of God and by the grace of God only. I promise you. I didn't have a thing in the world to do with it. She had, <laughs> you're going to have to shut up wherever you're sitting. <laughs> Somebody come over and sit next to him. And, no, I'm, I'm teasing <laughs> but the truth is, I, I really feel like I, I have a better understanding of what real love is because of our demonstration of love through the years. Now listen to me carefully. You don't have to have been married 56 years in order to demonstrate love. You could have been married 56 weeks, 56 months, or days as far as that's concerned. What matters is the demonstration of love that you demonstrate to the one you say you love. The Bible says in, in the book of Romans, chapter 5 and verse 8, but God demonstrated his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Okay. The, word, the word in the King James is the word commendeth, but it literally means God demonstrated his love toward us. Amen. In that while we were yet, he didn't wait till he got good. He didn't wait till you stopped something. He didn't wait till you sold out or whatever. He just said, I, I love you, period. And I think we all can agree that, that we live, you know, in our day and time, we're living in a very, very uh, confusing time. Uh, and what I mean by that is uh, uh, the society in which we live. I mean, we've got a society nowadays that men think they're women and women think they're men and We've even got a young person here in Walton County that thinks they're a cat. You know, it's just we're living in some confusing times. But I think there's also a great deal of confusion when it comes to God and it comes to the church and it comes to religion per se in, in general, you know. And I can understand much of that confusion. Much of the confusion that goes on today in the world out there is the result of the people in here. We say one thing in here. Hallelujah, glory to God. We raise our big black Bible and all that kind of stuff. We walk out those doors and live like hell. The world gets confused because of the way we live. You say that you're a Christian. You say you're going to go to heaven. Yeah. Uh, I, I taught Sunday school. Or my daddy was a deacon or whatever you know I, I, I'm good but there's never ever demonstrated the love of God in your life people wouldn't know that you're a Christian people wouldn't know that at all your children wouldn't know that you're a Christian we're more concerned about impressing our kids and grandkids and, and, and those that, that, that are close to us with stuff than with him and when you die, you're going to leave it all. I preach funerals of paupers, and I preach funerals with multimillionaires. And there's one thing in common. They left it all. So it's important that you and I live up to who we say that we are. And what I want you to do for just these few minutes that we're going to take, I want you to, to lay aside any and all preconceived ideas that you may have about God, about the Bible, about the church, about other Christians, about anything along that line. And all I ask you to do is make whatever decision you choose to make about your relationship 
with, with God based on the demonstration of God's love for you found in the person of Jesus Christ. That's all I ask you to do. Don't sit there and look at somebody else and say, well, I, they're a hypocrite, and they probably are. We all have hypocrisy in us. I don't care who you are. Uh, but I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm asking you to just lay all that aside for a few minutes. Ask God to give you a blank slate, so to speak. And just make your choices and decisions based on what God's Word says. Now, you know, I could go through the Scripture and I could go back in Genesis and try to work my way all the way through, you know, the prophets and all that kind of stuff and the Psalms and give you the Gospel. I, you know, that's possible. But uh, all I want to do this morning is take one verse, John 3, 16, and just take it apart, show you just five or six things about that one verse. And in that one verse, you can make a choice and decision about what you want to do as far as your life's concerned. You know, uh, so let's, let's see if we can take it apart and... I hope you'll, and most of you can follow along with me, even though you, you know, you don't, maybe you don't have your Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. The first thing I want you to see is the object of God's love. For God so loved the world. You know, it's really ironic, and most folk don't know this, but Christ's public ministry he never got out of Palestine, out of that area over there in Palestine and Israel and such as that. But his love was not limited to just Palestine. His love was demonstrated universally. His love is still being demonstrated without distinction. His love is without exception. His love is known everywhere. A lot of people call him a great man. They call him a great prophet. I call him God. Call him a savior. His love is without, you know, Christianity is the only religion in our day and time that does not ask works for a person to get saved or like the Muslims to kill somebody else in order to have 70 virgins in heaven. We just love people to Jesus as best we can. But the problem is, we who call ourselves Christians are so wrapped up in us and what we want, we forget about all those and the needs in other people's lives. So the object of God's love, not my love, not somebody else's love, but the object of God's love, God so loved the world. And one of the, another thing about that is, do you know that you can't be so bad that God won't save you? And you can't be so good that you don't need to get saved. But you can't be so bad because some of y'all are boogers. I mean, genuine, bona fide boogers. We all are. But God will save the biggest booger. That's probably not the best terminology. I need to try to stay sophisticated best I can. My wife looks at me after, you know, after church. We go, she says, you did some of the stupidest things. She says it in love, but, but she, she says it nonetheless, okay? So the object of God's love is the world. Second thing is the gift. The gift says his only begotten son. Now, personally, I, I believe this is where people struggle the most. You say, why would people struggle with, with a gift? Pride gets in the way. What I mean by that is simply this. If I can be saved and go to heaven, then what do I need to do? You don't need to do anything other than put your faith in Christ. No, no, no. No, wait a minute, preacher. I'm not accustomed to getting anything without working for it. I've worked hard, you know, uh, all my life, and, and I enjoy the fruits of my labor. So if I'm going to get something that is as valuable as eternal life, then do I need to go to church? Do I need to get baptized? Do I, do I need to work hard? Do I need to serve as an usher? Do I need to get money? What do I need to do? You need to see yourself as a sinner in need of a Savior. Put your faith and trust in Christ, period. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. 
There's nothing that you can do to save yourself. God's done it all. And it's imperative that we understand that. You know, how many people will miss heaven because they thought they had to do something? The Bible says in Romans chapter 6 and verse 23, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Here's the issue. Here's where people struggle, is receiving the gift. Let's say, for instance... I offered a gift. I walked around here and I offered a gift. There are, there are a number of people that would accept it without hesitation. I have no doubt about that, okay? And that's good. But if I offered a gift, there are others that would reach in their pocket and they would want to pull out a $5 bill or whatever they had in their pocket. Preacher, I appreciate it, but here. But if you paid anything whatsoever for it, it ceases being a gift. You have to either accept it. Nope, I reject it. You say, but I'm trying hard and I mean well and and, and I I can remember getting baptized. Well, I got baptized when I was little. If I died, I'd busted hell wide open because I'd never come to the place where I saw myself as a sinner in need of a Savior. You say, well, how do you know that took place? Because God changed me. You don't come in contact with God and stay the same. You you just don't. How do you know? Because the Bible says that. You become a new creation in Christ Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says that. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Third point. The reason that God gave. For God so loved. I think we all have heard the terminology to reconcile. Uh, many of all, many people have uh, make that application to uh, marriage. You know, people will go through a season in their life and they, they, they separate or, or whatever it may be. And uh, uh, before long, God willing, you hear that they have reconciled their differences. Okay? They, they, they've come back together. That's what the word reconcile means. And it's because of our sin that we need to be reconciled to God. I'll read a verse there. You don't have to turn there, but it's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21. It's probably one of the greatest verses in all of Scripture. For he, meaning God, hath made him, talking about Christ, to be sin for us, sin for you, sin for me. Why? Who, Christ, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. What took place? There's a a doctrine that's taught in Scripture that's not mentioned a great deal. It's the doctrine of imputation, to impute. It's a banking term, and it means to apply to one's account. The moment that I bowed my head, and a person, anybody that bowed their head and was serious about God, the moment that we bow our head and put our faith and trust in Christ... All of the righteousness of Jesus Christ was applied to my spiritual account. All of my sins that I had ever committed, would ever commit, uh, past, present, or future, were placed on Jesus Christ. We had a swap. We went from here to here, from here to here. I stand before God Almighty in the righteousness of His Son, Jesus Christ. Not in my righteousness. Because the Bible says my righteousness are like filthy rags. The best I can do and the best you can do is like a filthy rag. And I had a swap. You say, you can sit there and say, well, I'll tell you what. I'll take care of it. I'll face it when I face it. <laughs> yes, you will. And I'll tell you what, I've been able to buy myself out of all this all these years. or I've been able to fight myself out of it. Yeah, well, good luck on that. It's not going to happen. Fourth thing is the offer. That whosoever, rich, poor, black, white, gay, straight, doesn't make any difference. For whosoever, anybody can be saved. That God calls. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Saved. 
whosoever. Me, you, anybody. Fifth thing. There's the condition. For whosoever believeth in him. The key here is the word believeth. It means to place your faith in, your trust in, totally and completely. You know, it is phenomenal and amazing that we go to a doctor to cure us. We go to a pharmacist to fill up a prescription. We trust the doctor. We trust the pharmacist. You even demonstrated faith in here this morning. Every single one of you are demonstrating faith. You sit in that chair, trusting that chair is going to hold you up. You put your faith in it. We trust all that, but we won't trust Christ. We read the Bible. Yeah, I don't know. That's kind of an old book, but I'll trust the doctor. There was, I can't remember. I wish I could remember who it was that was, I was talking to this morning or sometime this week, maybe this morning. And they said this friend of theirs went to the doctor, and the doctor says, you have bad indigestions. What you, you got bad indigestion. Found, come to find out she had pancreatic cancer. Bad diagnosis. You don't want to wait till that takes place. Because if you wait till the judgment, there is, as Terry said earlier, there is no plan B, period. It's either now or never. Not real complex. The Bible says there's only one way to heaven. I know oftentimes we want to believe that God's got a, another plan. Acts chapter 4 verse 12 says this, Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There is no other one. Christ was God incarnate, means Christ was God who took on flesh. Christ, God, went to the place called Calvary, and he showed how much he loved you by stretching out his arms, and he died on the cross. But your rejection of him, when you turn your back on him and say, I got no use for you, I'm more interested in doing my thing, I'm more interested in what this world's got to offer, all the toys, all the fun, and I'll worry about that when I get there. I'm doing all I can to tell you, you don't have to. You don't. We're to trust in a person. We're not to trust in anything else other than the person of Christ. And then number six, my last point, is the promise. Shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Shall not perish. The word perish in Scripture means everlasting, eternal separation from God. It talks about that in the book of the Revelation. If you're familiar with the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 20 and verse 14 says this, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now listen carefully. It's the second death. You see, guys, if you have been born only once, you'll die twice. But if you have been born twice, you'll die only once. You say, what in the world does that mean? Well, if you've been born only once, then that means you've not been born again. If you go back to the early part of John chapter 3, twice Jesus made mention. He said to this religious leader, he said, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must be born again. Now, pretty well, if Christ said it twice, it ought to get our ear. You must be born again. And if you've been born twice, you'll only die once, meaning you'll only die physically one time. But to die, be born only one time, you'll die twice. You'll die not only physically, but you'll die spiritually. And that's exactly what he's talking about. In, in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. You see, hell is not the final abode for people that turn their back on God and reject Christ and the grace of God. There is a place that's worse than that. It's called the lake of fire. 
He says in John chapter 3, he talks about everlasting life. And, and I, I don't know what your take may be on everlasting. I just know in the book of John that Jesus promises each of us everlasting life. John chapter 3, this is what he says in verse 18. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because they not believe on the name of the only begotten Son. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life. But the wrath of God abideth on him. You know, it's my prayer and my plea that somehow the, this morning that you've understood the demonstration of God's love. I want to read... Wrapping this thing up, I want to read one verse to you found in the book of Mark. It's important that you get this because I think this is where people struggle. Mark chapter 8, verse 36 and 37. Jesus was speaking. He was talking about the value of a soul. In Mark chapter 8, verse 36. For what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world? And lose his own soul. Or well, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? You know, truth is, most of us would not consider ourselves betting people. Now, <laughs> there are some exceptions in here. I'm not going to call any names, but there's a couple of exceptions in here as far as people that bet. Okay? But most of us would not consider ourselves. But truth is, we're all betting people. In some way. Let me show you what I mean. There are those that will listen to what I just got through saying. And, and, and talking about the demonstration of the love of God. They heard it. And truly. They accept it. But the problem is. They're betting. This book's not true. You say. Well how do you know? Will it take a fool to reject the grace of God and salvation that's offered to any and all? So they're saying, well, you know, be honest with you, preacher, I'm really betting that that book that you hold is not really true. But if it is, then I guess I'll have to answer someday because of the choice that I'm making in life now. And you, you, you're exactly right. You know, people say I'm willing to live like, you know, I, I bet that, that there is a heaven and a hell. And I'm going to make it somehow. But not unless you come God's way. There is no other way. The demonstration of God's love, the object of his love is the world. That's me and you. The gift of his only begotten son. He became sin for us. The reason that he gave is because he so loved. That's how he demonstrated his love. The offer is to whosoever. Your choice will impact. Here's, you know, if I could drive anything home this morning, it would be this. The choice that you make in your relationship with God impacts more than just you. You've got children. You've got grandchildren. You've got friends. So the choice that you make as far as demonstrating and accepting the love that God offers impacts more people than just you. The object, the gift, the reason, the offer is to whosoever. Your choice. The condition to believe on him. And the promise shall not perish but have everlasting life. I close with this little illustration. I read it this morning. And I really didn't have it planned to be in my message. But after I read it, I thought, well, let me see if I can work it in. So I may have to read some of it. So listen carefully. A husband and a wife one day were fussing. They were really going at it. So the wife suggested that they write down their complaints on a piece of paper and then show the other person exactly how they felt. She thought it might cut down on some of the bickering. The husband agreed and got the paper out, and she got out the pencils, and they both started writing. They both wrote 
furiously for a while. The husband would pause. <laughs> He'd look at his wife and write some more. The wife would pause and look up at her husband and write some more. The husband paused again, looked at his wife, and even angrier looked on her, looked on his face, and then he would write some more. The wife did the same and then put her pencil down. Her husband was still writing. He looked up in a fury and continued writing. He kept writing. Then he wrote some more. Then he wrote even more. The wife was getting furious because she'd covered her one side of the page and her husband was finishing the back side of his paper. He kept looking up at her and kept coming up with more, more to write. And every time he looked up, something new would come and he'd write something more down. The wife and all of she was hurting. She was in pain and agony. She clenched her fist and tears of anger were welling up in her eyes. And finally, her husband said that he was finished. They exchanged sheets of paper and they looked at each other's sheet. And as soon as she gave him her sheet and looked at his, she felt terrible. She wanted to take her sheet back. For when she looked at her husband's sheet of paper, in spite of the anger and in spite of his pain, he had written on every line on his paper, front and back, I love you, I love you, I love you. I'm ticked off, but I love you. I'm angry, but I love you. I don't want to be here right now, but I love you. And when she saw that much love, it covered the multitude of sins that had brought up the argument in the first place. When Jesus Christ died upon the cross, he looked at you and he looked at me and he said, I love you. I love you and I'll pay for all of them. Every single one of them. And you don't have to worry about a one. Father, we thank you so much for the demonstration of your love. It's beyond my comprehending that you could do that. It's beyond my comprehending that you know all about me. And you know all about every individual in this room. There is no secrets with you. None whatsoever. And you still love us. You demonstrated that love some 2,000 years ago. Knowing, because you're sovereign knowing our lives, knowing what we would do, knowing what we would be like, and you still demonstrated your love. It's just hard to grasp. I don't think I have the capacity to be able to understand that you would love me that much. Lord, my prayer this morning is that people in this room or maybe those that will watch or listen to this later on <coughs> would grasp and understand the demonstration of the love of God of how much you love each of us and how much you want our lives to bring honor and glory to you but Lord I think most of all this morning it's my prayer that people would understand this their lives if it does not have a demonstration of the love of God to other people, they've got loved ones, they have children, they have grandchildren that's going to miss heaven and go to hell because we're not willing to demonstrate the love of Christ to other people. We're not willing to pay that price. You told us to take up our cross and follow you. You never said it would be easy to live the Christian life. You never promised that. But Lord, first of all, we got to know that we know Christ is Savior. That's first among everything else. After that, we begin the process of becoming like Jesus, to grow, to demonstrate that love. So Lord, my prayer this morning is if there's a person in this room that does not know Christ is Savior, that they would be willing this morning to repent of their sin, turn from their sin and turn to the person of Jesus Christ 
and Christ only. Not the church, not baptism, not good works, just the Christ. How? By saying something like this, Jesus, I know this morning, I realize how much you love me. I'm so sorry for my sin. Forgive me. Come in my heart and life and be my Savior today. I'm trusting you and you only to save me. Help me to be like Jesus. Help me to impact those that I love so much. Because all this stuff doesn't matter. Lord, there may be some here this morning that just need to come up here at this altar and say, Lord, I'm so sorry. I know I'm saved, but I haven't been demonstrating that love to others. There may be some need church home. That's true, we invite them. God, whatever the need may be today, we pray your will be done. We'll thank in Christ's name, amen.